We have three esteemed guests here this evening, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce. Um, uh, and first of all, gentleman to my left here, uh, Yanis Varoufakis is an author, academic e economist, parliamentarian, political leader, and Greece's former finance minister. He cur currently leads, do we, is it M-E-R-A or M-R-A? How do you pronounce it? Mera. Mera, yeah, okay. Mera 25, the Greek political party belonging to DM 25, Europe's first transnational movement. In his own words, Varoufakis was thrust onto the public scene by Europe's insane handling of an inevitable crisis. In January 2015, he was elected to Greece's parliament with the largest majority in the country and served as Greece's finance minister between January and early July of 2015. During those tumultuous six months, he faced down the authoritarian ineptitude of the world's most political institutions, powerful institutions, apologies, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. Three institutions determined to impose upon the poorest of Greeks the harshest austerity in history. Varoufakis resigned the finance ministry when he refused to sign a loan agreement that perpetuated Greece's debt deflationary cycle. A year later, Varoufakis co-founded the M25, the Democracy in Europe movement, and two years after, he launched its Greek, Greek electoral wing, Mira, A20, Mira 25. He is one of the co-founders of the Progressive International, a global movement whose affiliated members exceed 200 million persons from across the world. He has traveled extensively giving talks and participating in various activist events and projects. He has been a staunch supporter of Palestinian rights and has consistently been an insightful and astute critic of the EU. A warning many years ago that not only would the EU's dreadful handling of the financial crisis savage ordinary people and Europe's long-term economic prospects, it would have far-reaching and potentially disastrous political effects. He is the author of a number of best-selling books, most recently, Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism. With many thanks for being here tonight, Yanis Varoufakis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, judging by the crowd here tonight, the European elections must be in the air. <laughs> so we've gathered here to talk Europe. Unfortunately, there is not much Europe left to speak of. Not seriously. The European Union's leaders, rulers, have successfully turned Europe into a, a genuine subcontractor of Washington, D.C. They've caused Europe to fall behind in every regard, technologically, just strategically, strategically, industrially, uh, environmentally, and of course, morally. Yes, we're here to talk Europe, not to praise it, but to bury this awful, this hideous, this heartless European Union whose rulers are hell-bent on war and naked exploitation of humanity and of nature. We're here to tell the people of Palestine of our commitment to fight for their rights on behalf of the Palestinians inside the European Parliament. Along with our comrades, our Jewish comrades, in particular I want to mention the Jewish Voice for Just Peace, our comrades in Berlin, who've been at the forefront of exposing Ursula von der Leyen for the lunatic, genocide, cheerleading, President of the European Commission that she is, these are simply words that I'm repeating that Claire Daly has had the guts to utter inside the European Parliament. We are here to tell the people of Ukraine of our steadfast commitment to a swift, just peace. Instead of the never-ending war, Brussels is planning for them on behalf of Washington. And we're here to tell our people in Ireland, in Greece, in Germany, across the European Union, one simple thing. Everything should be different. Everything can be different. 
But nothing will change unless we build barricades to stop the warmongers and the oligarchs in their tracks. Tonight, I feel very privileged to be sharing the stage with two renowned barricade builders, the most renowned barricade builders that this rebellious nation has produced. The earliest image that my teenage self in the 1970s had of Bernadette was that photograph of her piling up stones from which to construct barricades. I'm so pleased about two things. First, that she's still doing it. And secondly, because six years ago, I had a great honor again of her and her comrades in Derry showing me the Bloody Sunday Monument and in, just in front of it, in front of it, opposite, was the, a mural with exactly the same picture. And then, of course, there is Claire Daly, another extraordinary barricade builder. For the past five years, Claire has used, not stones, but well-chosen words on the floor of the European Parliament to build barricades by which to stop in their tracks the warmongers, the genocide supporters, and the oligarch agents that appear in front of the European Parliament as if they have a mandate on our behalf behind our backs. Comrades, friends, a question. Why is Europe failing in ways that even the United States is not failing, or India, or other capitalist countries? Why is Europe becoming a nasty, brutish, stupid, and therefore irrelevant for the rest of the world continent? Because for 20 years, austerity for the many, combined with socialism for the very few, particularly the financiers, to crash investment in the things that Europe needs. That's why. Some of us who found ourselves, however briefly, in the ECOFIN, in the Eurogroup, in the rooms where decisions are made, try to avert this. We proposed Eurobonds and fancy smart financial blueprints by which to mobilize the central bank's money tree to fund green tech, green energy, education, health. But the ruling class didn't want to hear of it. But why didn't they want to hear it? Could they not see that um, their Europe was a pyramid scheme? Could they not see that when the many can't spend, they can't be good quality jobs for their constituency? Did the so-called Europeanists not see that their shenanigans were turning Europe into America's vassal? Of course they could see it. It was not a failure. Europe's decline wasn't caused by its system's failure or breakdown. It occurred because the European Union system performed exactly as it was designed. Back in the 1970s, after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, for those of you who remember it, America's and Europe's ruling classes have been proceeding since the 1970s on the basis of what I call a dark deal, one that they struck back then in the 1970s. The dark deal starts is at the heart of the dark deal is America's trade deficit, which acts like a huge vacuum cleaner, Hoover, sucking into the United States Europe's exports. European capitalists, capitalists, therefore, as a result of this, Hoover, depend on the United States trade deficit for their dollar profits. But unable to spend dollars in Europe here, they send them back to Wall Street to lend to the American state, to buy shares in Wall Street, and to purchase real estate in California and Miami. That's the dark deal. America keeping European capitalists rich as long as they send their dollar profits to America to fund Washington, to keep Wall Street liquid, and to keep American retirees in, in luxury. To continue getting dollar rich, European capitalists need the euro to plunder poor European nations like the Greeks, like most of the Irish. But they do not want the euro to compete with the dollar. They do not want the euro to sideline the dollar 
because their profits are in dollars. This is why Europe's ruling class will back any war demanded by the United States military industrial complex. That's the darkest aspect of the dark deal. We begin now to see why Europe's ruling class, they, why they condone things that damage them. Think of Nord Stream 1. Now we know it, there's no doubt whatsoever, that it was the United States military that blew up Nord Stream 1 at a huge cost to German capitalists, industrialists. Why didn't they say a word? Well, it's really very simple. America's deficits line the pockets of the German industrialists with dollars which they can only use to accumulate wealth in the United States, put simply. We are ruled by a ruling class whose wealth accumulates on the Atlantic's other side. Is it any wonder that their allegiance also lies on the Atlantic's other side? That's when the United States seized upon Putin's cruel invasion of Ukraine. There's no doubt that it was a cruel invasion of Ukraine. An unacceptable invasion of Ukraine, but the United States seized upon this as an opportunity for a never-ending war. And what did Europe's rulers did, even though they knew that the Ukraine war was not in their economic interest? They kept silent. This is why Europe's ruling class, our oligarchs, would send their own children to the trenches. They would imprison their children if they dared demonstrate too loudly at the universities, because their hypocrisy is mind-numbing. They say they do not want debt, right? They're against public debt. They don't want common debt across Europe, Europe ones. But they bend over backwards to produce debt for themselves and their brethren. They say that they hate the money trade, but they pluck it energetically when it comes to spending billions on weapons or on lining the pockets of the financiers who transport their dollars to Wall Street. They scream blue murder when Ukrainians are invaded, their land is flattened, their hospitals are destroyed. But they consider it justifiable homicide when the occupiers and the attackers wear Israeli army uniforms. They liken Putin to Hitler to argue against any peace process with Russia. But they want the Ukrainians to take Moscow on their own with weapons they have sold them. This hypocrisy is not only a moral insult to the direct victims of war and genocide in Palestine, in Ukraine, in Yemen, in Syria, in Kashmir, it is also a clear and present danger for our people here in Dublin, across Europe. Lies and orchestrated industrial scale hypocrisy is the starting point of internal tyranny and external wars. We need to expose them. We're in the midst of a long slide to authoritarianism. The European Parliament elections cannot stop it. But we can place some voices in Brussels, like Claire Daly's, that will inspire Europeans to stiffen their lip and organize better across our borders. On this, you have our word. If you send Claire back to the European Parliament, if my voters honor me with a seat in the European Parliament, we commit to giving them hell every moment of every day for five years. We shall expose the NATO stooges, all the enablers of Israel, all the shadowy salesmen of weapons of mass destruction, both mass destruction in terms of bombs and nuclear weapons, but also of the financial weapons of mass destruction, the CDOs, the CDSs, the various bond instruments with which they are entangling the people of Ireland, the people of, of, of uh, Greece, in greater and greater risk as we speak. Comrades, friends, Dubliners, citizens, in a little over a month's time, you will have a chance to vote for us. For Claire Daly in Dublin, my comrades, for 42 excellent candidates that we are fielding in Greece. Mera 25 is running in Italy. We just collected 55,000 signatures to be able to do this in Italy. 
we already have the right to um, run in Germany unless we are banned <laughs> at the last moment. By the way, I never imagined that I would be banned from Germany for participating in an event like tonight's. And even to be banned from zooming in or Skyping in in such an event. Not one political party, not one, even the left accepted that as the right thing to do, supposedly because we were terrorism trivializers. Why? And that's something that the people of Ireland must understand in their bones because we dared separate atrocities against civilians, which of course we condemn, from the right to resist an occupation, a system of apartheid. That is what the German state is doing. In the name of fighting anti-Semitism, it is denying the people of Palestine the right to resist a system of expropriation. It's so simple. So, we have a European Parliament election. You must vote for Claire. It's very clear, right? It is clear. But don't get me wrong. We are not politicians who stand here in front of you, of you saying, vote for us, we'll go to Brussels, to Strasbourg, and we are going to fix Europe with the brilliant laws that we are going to usher in. Anybody who tells you that is lying, either to you, or to themselves, or to both. You cannot change Europe through this pseudo-parliament. No. What we're asking for is your vote so that we can go in there and tear off the masks from their ugly faces and expose their hypocrisy and turn the European Parliament into a pan-European theatre where their absurdity becomes evident in the eyes of Europeans across the breadth and the width of the European continent because that is the necessary but not sufficient condition for Europe to wake up. This is why I I urge you to vote for Claire, for us, because if the twin authoritarianism of the radical center on the one hand and the ultra-right on the other dominate the European Parliament, war will appear as the only policy, mass migrant death on our land and sea borders will appear as the only alternative, humanity and nature will continue to be plundered, indignity will become further entrenched in Europe, freedom will die. All sorts of freedom will die along with the right to know what our governments are doing behind our backs in our name, exactly as Julian Assange is dying every day, is being murdered every day in his high security prison cell at Belmarsh. <laughs> it is now evident that there are no limits to the lengths this Europe will go to to silence you. So don't be silent. Vote for Claire. Vote for candidates that will annoy the living daylights out of an establishment that is dragging Europe through the mud, that is ruling on the basis of a dark deal, which is pushing us increasingly into an unprecedented version of the Dark Ages. Thank you very much. Bernadette Devlin McCallisky needs no introduction, I'm sure. She's one of this island's most famous activists, one of its most storied civil rights campaigners. She's a legend, a hero to countless men and women across Ireland. For more than 50 years, she has campaigned, agitated, organized. In the 1960s, she was a founding member of the student movement's People's Democracy. And in April 1969, aged just 21, she was elected to West Minister Parliament, the youngest ever MP in the place, a title she held until 2015. In 1970, she went to prison for six months for her role in the Battle of the Bogside the previous year. On an, on an American tour after the Battle of the Bogside, she was given the key to the city of New York, and she gave it to the Black Panthers. <laughs> She 
saying, saying it belonged to the poor people of New York. In 1972, when the British Home Secretary, Reginald Maudling, falsely claimed that the Parachute Regiment had acted in self-defence during Bloody Sunday, Michalowski, Devlin, as she was then, who was the only member of the Parliament who had witnessed the Bloody Sunday event, crossed the floor of the chamber and slapped Maudling in the face. <laughs> Before, before being herself assaulted by another MP, told to apologise, she refused and said, I'm just sorry I didn't get him by the throat. <laughs> She's no stranger to European elections, having run as an independent candidate in, uh, in one in 1979. She subsequently helped form the national H Block Armagh and was a key organiser in that campaign. The campaign leaders were singled out for assassination by the UDA from October 1980, and she and her husband were consequently shot and severely injured during a murder bid by UDA gunmen in January 1981. When the Good Friday Agreement was signed, McAllister pointed out that its mechanism for designating members of the Assembly as either nationalist, unionist or other reinforced the existing divisions in society. She has said, and she's worth quote, quoting at length on this, the peace process was never about ending sectarianism, but about managing it and keeping it within the parameters of non-violence and political control. If you reflect back on it, the explanation for me is that this is a militarist philosophy, afraid of democracy. It doesn't trust the people. The parties work in government in exactly the same way. It's not that they don't understand democracy, they don't believe in it. And the institutions that arise from that our institutions of control. She spent the next 25 years in community organizing at local level. And as you can see from, from her presence here tonight, she continues to campaign nationally and locally on social justice and human rights. She's a woman who can be best and an example to all of us. Bernadette McAllister. Thanks very much. Uh, something I have to do first of all because I promised two tickets to two very good people and I've got to post them to them but I was assured that they actually made it in. Is that right? Is Vincent here? Yes. <laughs> Thanks be to God for that Vincent. And God doesn't even exist. <laughs> I'm really sorry, I, didn't, I forgot the technology bit about sending you the code, and, and that's been on my mind. So now that I can, now that I can breathe easy again, uh, it's a privilege and, and a joy for me to share the platform tonight with, with, with Claire and, and with Yanis Varoufakis. I, I, I had the privilege of uh, chairing and, and, and interviewing Yanis when he came to speak for us at, at the Bloody Sunday March uh, weekend, some six, can't believe it, six years ago. Uh, and as always, uh, the, the, we don't spend enough time listening. We don't spend enough time listening to each other and learning and, and educating ourselves on, on not simply the, the, the key principles and fundamentals which we all share, but the nuances and intrigues of what is happening uh, in the world around us and how it affects us. And we can't all be on song with all of it. So we need to listen to all the different voices within that broad movement whose experiential knowledge, and I mention it all the time, it's the hardest school of learning, but the most enduring. And we underestimate we underestimate what people know because they live through it, not because it's a theory they ascribe to uh, and, and some people hang on to because they can't let go. So it's, it's important when we gather here tonight to recognise right from the neighbourhood le level, and I see some of my great friends and, and associates from, from neighbourhood organising here tonight as well, there is a non-broken link 
and it's not a vertical straight line between neighborhood organizing and what's wrong with our ability to make greater progress at national and international level in changing the world. And sometimes I think that we have to be constructively critical within ourselves about how we really get over ourselves and get on with the diversity of work within common cause that we each have to do. And there's a thing about these so-called democratic elections uh, that can get in the way of that. It's not so bad where you have proportional representation, but uh, that's why, they, why the, the, the British aren't as slow as you think, you know. In government. <laughs> that's why they are vehemently opposed to it. The first past the post in the race for democratic voices is the most straightforward way of stifling them and turning people against each other uh, if there's only going to be a race for a prize for the first to cross the line. But elections can, can divide us because people start to look for the minutiae of difference. You know, Claire will fall victim to this all the time, as do others. And you'll say, you know, people will say, uh, oh yes, I've heard, I've heard Claire speak on, on Palestine. That's, that's very good. Uh, but I heard she's a Putinista. What in God's name is a Putinista? <laughs> it's a word somebody made up because they don't know what Claire, and they do know what Claire has to say about, about Ukraine, what she has to say about NATO, what she has to say about Putin's invasion of Ukraine. They know all of that, but not loud enough for them. And somebody told them that uh, she was a Putinista and it sounded like a good word. So you just keep saying it. It reminds me of the days, and there are people in this room, I know you all, <laughs> when we were Provo Trots, do you remember that? Well, God be the days when you could be a Provo and a Trot. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I have to say. So, so I think about when we're coming to, to the next six weeks, what our minds need to be focused on, and always focused on, which side of the line are we on? My whole weight is going in 100% behind Claire because this is the clearest voice with the greatest integrity, the least fear, and the best understood by people who know what's right and wrong, but they don't know what the nuances are. But they know where they should stand as decent human beings. And so the most important thing that I think we have to do for Palestine, for Ukraine, for Ireland, against NATO, against racism here, for the homeless here, for the asylum seekers here, is make that voice that is clear, that voice that stands for humanity, and that is unafraid of the system. Make sure that that continues to be heard in that amplified theatre. And when we've done that, then we can look down that list and see the other people who are on the same side of the line and give them the next one and the next one and the next one. Because elections are not simply about sending people anywhere. They are about neighbourhood organising as well. They're about being able to have conversations. Now, I know the European Union election is a big election, and you can't fight it like the local council election. You can't be in every door in every neighbourhood. Now, you could be if the basis of organising was always the neighbourhood. Because then you would just leave the neighbourhood to get on with it, confident that there were people in that neighbourhood who could do it. So we can't do that kind of thing in six weeks, or I would be making you do it, and so would Rita. I see her in the front <laughs> row. But what we can do, what everybody in this room can do, is take a personal responsibility 
to ensure over the next six weeks that you bring up the issues that have to be talked about. Not just at meetings, not just, you know, you bring them up at the kitchen table. Those of you who, who have siblings, who have fellow students, who have partners, who have grannies or grandchildren, with or without a vote, and discuss these issues and why it is important that we take the positions that we do. Because the people who are organised better than us are the people who own the systems. And they are increasingly. A phrase I first heard when I went to America, and, and I just as you know, I love words, I use a lot of them. But I love language, I love... Uh, and I raised two generations of children. I have two small grandchildren aged nine and five who are absolutely fascinated by the sounds of words and the meanings of them. And I keep saying, Granny did a good job there. <laughs> but the first time I heard in America was about the lumpen proletariat. And I thought, what is the lumpen? What is the lumpen? Only Americans could think of that phrase, the lumpen proletariat. And I thought they were an American invention. I was very innocent when I was young. I thought that there must be some, you know, some kind of ordinary person that you only find in the cities of, of, of New York. The lumpen proletariat are alive and well in Dublin. Poor, <coughs> uneducated people. And when I say uneducated people, that's not a criticism of those without education. It is a criticism of a nation that denied them an education. That denied people left, right and centre the opportunity to learn to think critically as opposed to learn to repeat after me and learn the consequences of not being controlled. <laughs> so those are the people who in the midst of half a nation or, well, 26 out of 32 counties of a nation, but a state nonetheless, that is no longer poor. You know, we have a history of oppression, a history of emigration still continues. We have a history of impoverishment as a result of colonization. But we're not poor now. We're certainly not on this side of the border. We're still fairly poor on the other at the minute. Uh, we're not poor. It's a wealthy nation. But the wealth is being held in fewer and fewer hands. And, and the gap between the rich and the poor, and those people that my mother and father used to speak of when we were young, the middle classes, they're an interesting bunch of people. My mother said, and she was right, the middle class is a working class with notions above its station. <laughs> Salaries are wages, no matter what you call them. You can't live without them, and you don't get them without working. But we have a state class. We have a political class of gombeans, working class people with notions above their station. A lot of them working for the state, officials and agents of the state apparatus. Uh, it's very big in, 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 U, in the UK as well. And all of these people at the minute have a hymn sheet to sing off, which is that this small country of ours as a neutral country needs to shake itself out of its historic past, needs to get over its understanding of colonization, and to distort and twist the words of the great Robert Emmett, take its place amongst the nations of the earth, amongst the NATO nations of the earth. Move away from neutrality and peace, 
and followed the rest of the European nations into the slavery that, that Yanis has spoken of into being the, the sub-agents, the gum beans, the gophers for an expansionist United States of America. Bad enough that our major political parties and Taoiseachs and would be at it. Bad enough that the right-wing slobbering journalists of most of our remaining newspapers Never mind the Provo Trots, God be with the days when the Irish Times was a liberal newspaper. That, I'm old enough to remember that. But we are fed a diet daily that the war in Ukraine means we need to continue the drift towards buying into NATO. We need to water down our neutralization. We need to allow greater access to the United States for Shannon. We need to let Biden and the United States of America know this country is not for sale. Yeah. This country... <laughs> this country will not become a colony of the United States or a state on the other side of the Atlantic of the United States. We will not easily give up our constitution. And we need to make as part of our campaign in every political party that anybody that is not writing in favor because they challenged our president. The president is right, and we are blessed with the president we have. Long may he survive. <laughs> the president is right on his authority and responsibility to speak out and defend the, the, the neutrality of this country, and that it is his constitutional duty to do it. And to avoid any further doubt, we need to be campaigning to write neutrality into the Constitution and have a referendum on that before von der Leyen and Biden drag the smug gits and control freaks currently running the country and lining up for the opportunity to run it drag us into NATO or European treaties that drag us into war. This country has never been at war with any other country in the world other than for our own freedom. We've never been at war with anybody but the British Empire. And we're certainly not going to war for a new expansionist America. So those things are important. <laughs> but it's also crucially important, now that we're on an island that's half in and half out and half in between the European <laughs> Union. You, you think it's complex down here, you want to live in the north. <laughs> we have no sea border. We have no land border. We're not in the European Union, but we sort of are. <laughs> but we don't have a voice in the European Union, but we do, because we have Claire. But at the same time, what's happening right now is because the United Kingdom are planning to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, and just a bit, you know, I rem uh, those of us in the North remember internment. They intend very soon, as asylum seekers turn up to meet their regular appointments, they intend to intern them, to gather people up and to detain them. They haven't committed a crime. They will have no idea how long they'll be detained, but they will be detained until they can be put on a plane to Rwanda. 
Small wonder then that some of those people, no doubt with a bit of support from, from uh, people who are in, in the UK government, they, they fly across from Birmingham, I believe, or fly across from anywhere in, in England or Scotland, into Northern Ireland and come across the border. And the government here now is going to put a border to stop them coming across into the south. And a new control freak of a Taoiseach, he's rushing through emergency legislation because it's not going to happen. This is part of the European Union. The asylum seekers coming across are coming across from the European Union, out of the European Union, and back into it again. Why are people being tortured like that? Why torture people like that? There's, I keep reminding people on this island alone. You don't always want to hear it. I'm going to tell you it again. We still have a smaller population in Ireland than we had before the famine. We have never recovered to the level of population we had before 1845. There was room for everybody before 1845. So when we get past the 1845 figure, tell me there's no room for more people. There is. And in 1845, we never built a building in our whole lives that was three stories tall, never mind 12. But nobody 100 years ago building vertically. So there's room for far more people. The reason people think there isn't is that our government refuses to look after the people who live here. There are no houses for the people who live here. So naturally, the poor in bad housing, in bad jobs that don't pay, say very simplistically, how is there room for more? We need to get rid of the government, not the immigrant, not the asylum seeker. We need to change the system. There is enough money. There's enough money. There's enough potential on this island to feed more people than currently live here. Nobody needs, absolutely nobody needs, the amount of money some people in RTE were learning before somebody learned how to count. <laughs> no need for it. It is a physical reality that most of us as adults have stomachs of the same size. Those of us who have slightly larger stomachs have them because we eat too much. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that because that might include me. But there's nobody needs to go hungry here. There's nobody should be lying in a tent. There's nobody should be lying on the street. There is no person with a mental health complaint who shouldn't be getting help. And we could do all of those things if we change the system. Part of the reason we don't change the system is not only the class of politician and system we have, but Europe doesn't want us to change it. Because we are bought into that. Now, I'm not saying then we get out. You just look at, you know. You cannot leave the European Union. I said it during Brexit. It's like a bad marriage. Finding somebody worse than the man you had is no way to escape from a bad marriage. Or a same-sex marriage. Or a civil partnership. Or a non-institutionalized long term. I, I forget how all you define the family down here. But it certainly lost your referendum. But let the people get on with living their own personal lives the way they want to and organize the conscience, the economy, the humanity of this nation. 
And in so doing, we will be strong enough to take on the oligarchy of Europe and its masters, the expansionist United States. In the meantime, get out and get a promise that every single person here, come hell or high water, at the end of the election can count that they went out and persuaded at least 50 people to vote for Claire. Thank you. Heather, we introduce Claire Daly. I'm sure most of you know her a fair bit of her already. She's been a political activist for going on 40 years and an elected, re elected representative for 25 of those. She's been variously described as a thorn in the side of the Irish establishment, a fearless advocate and a tireless campaigner. In 2015, Hot Press wrote that there's no shortage of influential figures in Ireland who'd be more than happy to see herself and Mick Wallace flattened. And that's as true today as it was nine years ago. A fierce and committed fighter for women's rights, she started campaigning for abortion rights in the 1980s, long before it was popular. She was one of the leading campaigners in the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment. Along with Mick Wallace, she highlighted the Garda penalty point scandal and championed the Garda whistleblowers who blew the, the lid on it. Stopped for a drink driving check at the height of the scandal, she was handcuffed, taken to a Garda station, and her arrest immediately leaked to the media. That whistleblower scandal saw two Garda commissioners and two ministers, ministers for justice take a fall. The drink driving stop wasn't the first time, or, or the last time she was thrown in the back of a Garda car. She was previously arrested in Dublin Airport as a shop steward for militant, militant secondary picketing. In 2003, as a county councillor, she broke an injunction during the anti-bin charge campaign and ended up serving a month in Mount Joy. In 2014, she was arrested again, this time at Shannon Airport, when herself and Mick Wallace broke into search the US warplanes following the government's persistent refusal to fulfill their obligations to do so. So, she's definitely trouble, <laughs> but she's not only that. She succeeded in getting legislation to mandate inquests into every case of maternal death in an Irish hospital passed while she was in the Dáil. Uh, one of the only times in history an opposition TD actually managed to get a law they proposed, passed and implemented. When she chaired negotiations on the European Parliament's 2019 Fundamental Rights Report, she managed to get a statement included to the effect that economic and social rights, things like the right to housing, a decent wage and so on, are fundamental rights. It was the first time ever the Parliament had done this, and every report since has followed her wording on it. Rather than going to Europe in 2019 and going mad, she went to Europe in 2019 and kept doing what she's always done, standing up for ordinary people. And that means standing against war, against injustice, and wherever it's done, and for equality, human rights, and peace. Please welcome Claire Daly. You're all just trying to warm yourselves up. I don't know, I thought it was the Greek fur sitting in his jacket, but uh, it's actually freezing here. But uh, thank you so much, Liam, and thanks to everybody for turning out, for being part of this event, which I feel is really a little bit special. There's an energy and a determination that's actually quite palpable. I think it was brilliantly articulated by Bernadette, and thank God, because after listening to Yanis, we're definitely going to need that energy and determination. And he's not wrong, because we call this meeting Europe Towards the Abyss. And in many ways, we're gone well past that point. I'm just back from Strasbourg, the last session of the current European Parliament mandate. I'm probably a little bit traumatised still after that. But just to give you a flavour of what it's like. So this was a session where our proposal to have a resolution on Gaza was absolutely trounced. 
Because why would the European Parliament be discussing something like that when there are much more important issues? Issues like, for example, Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel and the need for an EU response. That was on the agenda, no problem there. And when Mick Wallace moved to change the title to say Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus and Iran's retaliation, 22 out of 705 MEPs supported us in that call. That's the type of lunacy that you're dealing with. And if that one wasn't enough, they lined up one after the other to condemn and call for sanctions for Iran. The same people who have failed to condemn and sanction Israel. That wasn't bad enough. They had a little bit more work to do. So they used their last week of the parliament to further water down yet another environmental commitment. This time about farmers working with nature. It's not going to help any farmers whose problems are the below cost selling of the supermarkets or the very cutthroat trade deals, but it is definitely going to harm the environment. And of course, no European Parliament session is ever finished without us lecturing someone else outside of the European Union about rights and freedoms. And this time it was Georgia, a candidate country where the Georgian government were attacked for their lack of free speech, for their attacks on civil society. The very same people inside the European Union who banned Yanis from appearing in Germany, in France where they've locked up politicians and trade unionists for having the audacity to criticize Israel. This is a European Union lecturing other people on values. You could not make it up. And yet, that week, last week, was pretty much like every single other week in the European bubble. Or the European garden, as Joseph Burrell calls it, with all those people in the jungle outside. That garden where 99% of the MEPs and staff are white and 99% of the cleaners, caterers, and security guards are not. It is really absolutely the case that this was another week of collective lunacy, with the full involvement of Irish politicians unscrutinized and unchallenged by the mainstream media. Because of course you couldn't be criticizing the European Union. That would be septic Euroscepticism. That would be a bit of Farageism. It would be embarrassing, it would be a disgrace, it would be the mark of a character or a chancer, someone who doesn't understand the world and our place in it. Because sure, we all know that the European Union are the good guys. We're the ones with values and anybody who tells you otherwise is at best an Egypt, at worst a Russian spy. Well, they might have got away with that fairy tale for years. But when Ursula von der Leyen and her geopolitical commission planted the European Union into the middle of a genocide, everything changed utterly. It changed because nothing changed except the mask slipped. European values exposed murder, exploitation, plunder, dominance, colonialism, same as it ever was. And the latest genocidal campaign of the settler colonial Zionist state of Israel, which the Europeans started after all, wouldn't be happening, wouldn't be continuing without the support and enablement of the US and Europe, and every single person knows it. Because they're the ones who've sent armed shipments increasing tenfold to Israel to carry out a genocide and murder Palestinians. They're the ones who've cut funding to UNRWA the only lifeline to a civilian population which is being deliberately starved. They're the ones who continue to trade and privilege Israel with the EU-Israel Association Agreement, with massive access to Horizon Europe, with favoured access, no sanctions there. The European Union has managed to sanction 36 countries and they cannot bring in one sanction against Israel. Well, shame on them. They have lost any. <laughs> they have lost any credibility that they ever had to talk about rights and values to anybody else when they stand up 
uh, full square behind Israel time and again. And they have betrayed the people of Gaza just as if they have betrayed the people of Ukraine. Because the truth is, there is actually no difference in their stances in the two wars at all, except the rhetoric. Because they say they stand with Ukraine. But what does that mean? They've spent 133 billion of direct European funds in Ukraine, not to stop the war, but to make sure that it kept going. Because it was the US and the EU who refused to give Ukraine a security guarantee when they negotiated a peace agreement with Russia in April 2022, forcing Ukraine to fight on. They blocked the calls to stop the war in Ukraine, just as they blocked month after month the calls for a ceasefire in Gaza. And the result of that treachery, hundreds of thousands of innocent Ukrainians dead, millions displaced, the country destroyed, what hasn't been occupied by Russia has been bought up by transnational corporations. And working people all over Europe have paid a phenomenal price in a devastating cost of living crisis where Europe managed to shoot itself in both feet and ensure that Russia became the strongest economy in Europe. So much for European punishment. But the opportunity was too good to miss. And as von der Leyen herself said on the 1st of March, 2022, European security and defense has evolved more in the last six days than in the last two decades. This is a watershed moment for our union. And by God, she was right. Because Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine gave the EU Atlanticists, the Hawks, everything that they wanted and couldn't get for years. A Europe decisively split from Russia, united in a commitment of militarism and increased military spending, something they've been trying to get for years. A Europe comprehensively under American control and NATO rescued from oblivion with a new lease of life. European Union militarization, enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty as we warned it had been, brought to life when less than 10 years ago, the European Union decided to have a consultation on how are we going to make ourselves more safe and secure? I wonder who should we ask about that? Well, we'll form a little advice group and it'll be made up of a majority of people from the arms industry. And surprise, surprise, the lads came back with a proposal saying, if you want to make Europe safe, we have the answer. You need to spend more money on arms and we're the ones who can help you do it. So they got for the first time a European defence fund with 8 billion euros of public money assigned to direct militarism. EU militarism is now turbocharged. I could literally have you here all night talking about the different schemes. Schemes like the Orwellian European Peace Facility, 17.6 billion to use to spend on arms. Military mobility, scheme after scheme, all of them headed by another commissioner that is probably not as famous as Ursula, but uh, nonetheless a very powerful man, second in command, Thierry Breton. He's the one who manages all these. Where did he come from? He's a former CEO of a major French defence company. That's his record. He was never elected anywhere. That's his pedigree. We see now the European Investment Bank, which was supposed to be a green bank, to invest in projects to improve the climate. Not anymore. The money is being diverted now. Eight billion is going to defence. And of course, when you have war and climate insecurity everywhere, you're going to get migrants, people forced to leave their homes in search of safety and a better life. So no chance wasted there. The very same companies that profited from the arms to create the insecurity are benefiting 16 billion from the EU's border management and asylum and migration expenditure on drones, on surveillance and all the rest of it. And in the words of Julian Assange, the whole thing is a scam. When he talked about the war in Afghanistan, he said the goal is an endless war, not a successful war. The goal is to use Afghanistan to wash money out of the tax bases of the US and Europe into the hands of the security elites. And as it was then, so it is now. 
in Gaza, in Ukraine, in all of the interference around Africa, we're not promoting values, we're promoting interests. And they're the old colonial interests, same as they are. And of course, somebody has to pay for this. Money has to be made for these things. And who is going to pay for that? Well, we've already seen a billion taken out of the health budget. 2.1 billion out of the Horizon Europe budget to deal with research and innovation. 10 billion, which was supposed to deal with green energy, has been diverted to militarism. They've spent 540 billion on shielding customers from the energy crisis through the blowing up of Nord Stream and keeping their war going, as we pay four times for US LNG. European manufacturing on its knees, a devastating cost of living crisis, a housing crisis affecting every family. As Europe is the climate and the continent most vulnerable to massive temperature rises, which only last week it was predicted we'll see hundreds of thousands of Europeans dying and a trillion in a year to save us from coastal flooding. And all we can expect out of the new European Parliament and the new European Union, which is going to be headed up by Ursula again, she's the favourite candidate, believe it or not, is more of the same. Well, I think I speak for us all when I say we are well or truly in the abyss, not to mind heading towards it, because Europe is no longer a peace project. We are on the cusp of a fully fledged defence union, aligned with NATO, absolutely aligned with NATO, prepared to exercise hard power in non-permissive environments, which means environments where people don't want you to be there. A continent at war with Russia, a nuclear power in all but name. And what we've seen in Gaza is a brutality, the bonfiring of international law, a harbinger of a much more violent world where might is right. Now we know that it was always so, and the rules were only for the little guys. The big countries never stood by them, but at least they pretended. At least there was some restraint and some accountability. But Gaza has unleashed a horror that we thought we would never see. But all is not lost. You could be feeling very down in that. There are psychologists in Ireland treating people for free to deal with the trauma of what they're witnessing. So my God, how much worse for the people who are enduring this genocide month after month after month. But this barbarism is not the end. In fact, it is the beginning of the end for their system because it has awakened a people's movement the likes of which has not been seen. They have created their very own grave diggers. And in the magnificent display of youth power, that student movement which is rocking America, in the tradition of the magnificent campaign which defeated Vietnam, this Gaza is our Vietnam. And this Gaza will change history and will point a way forward for humanity because people all over the world are off their knees and they are not going back. They are not going to allow humanity be treated to the barbarism that is on display. And what we're here to say is that in that struggle, Ireland could and should play a decisive role, a role where our influence goes way beyond our size. As Bernadette said, we're a neutral country. We're a country that was formerly occupied, but firmly in the Western camp. We have a history of peacekeeping. That makes us unique. Imagine if Ireland took to the stage and said, we're going to give the Gaza flotilla a flag to fly over. to do as well. They could have done it 
in Patrick's Day. They could have spurned Butcher Biden and not turned up. Again, that would have been a beacon to people all over the world. It can be done because citizens all over Europe think exactly the same as we do. I've had the very good fortune to go and speak at meetings in many European cities, in Vienna, in Munich, in Stockholm, in countries where people had no choice but to join NATO. They weren't asked, they were forced into it. And they look at countries like Ireland and they say, we would love to exercise our neutrality. That is something which Ireland absolutely should be doing. It would not just be a beacon for people in Europe, but for people the world over. Our little small country, as we did when we joined the United Nations and moved the first proposal for nuclear disarmament, something no other country had done. Little Ireland was able to do that. We can do that again, to be a bridge to the countries which contain the majority of the world's population who support the non-aligned movement and a different way of multilateralism and peace. Our constitution says that we stand for the peaceable resolution of disputes and for upholding international law. Arguing that inside the European Union is not only possible, it's absolutely necessary. And when we have done it, it has been met by a phenomenal response the world over. It's been a humbling experience for myself and Mick Wallace to be able to use the European platform. I can say that there hasn't been a continent that we've been to, and we've been to most of them in this job, where people at some stage haven't come up to us and thanked us for the work and said, we wish there were more people like you. And that's not to blow our own trumpet, because we're nothing special. We're just Irish people defending Irish neutrality and Ireland's history and traditions. And there's a group of people in Irish society who are Europhiles. They're embarrassed by our Irishness. They think everything European is automatically better. They're the same people who bend the knee to Britain, who bend the knee to US imperialism. Well, we are not those people. And the reason why they hate us and vilify us time and again is that they know that we are the thorn in their side. And that's the only interest that we have in being there, is to hold them to account for their barbarism, for their butchery. The gap between those in power and the citizens of the world has never been greater. European politics is moving in the direction of US politics. Removed from the people, an unelected commission with powers above the interests of member states, in hoc with lobbyists. Big business, big pharma, big agri, and the military industrial complex, all of them bleeding us dry to line their own pockets. So this is the battle that we're up against. We're up against it at a time when the people of the world are off their knees. They can now understand what capitalism is. They now understand neoliberalism. It's capitalism with the gloves off. It's barbarism. It's violence. It's war. It's an unstable world when the world we should be dealing with is one of cooperation to tackle the biggest challenge facing us all, that of the climate catastrophe that is imminent. So as we face these elections, we do need to exercise our vote to go out there, to continue to try and hold that mandate, to hold those in power to account. The people in power have most definitely abused it. We have to build a better world. This is only part of it, but we are very proud and determined to continue that fight. And I thank you all for being here.